I'm going to cover techniques that will make a musical idea fit into dramatically different contexts so that it still sounds like the same theme, yet also different. Let's listen to an example of this from John Powell's score to How to Train Your Dragon. That's a triumphant version of a flying theme when Hiccup finally rides on a dangerous dragon he's become friends with. But the same theme occurs earlier, before they become friends, and Hiccup panics to read about the dragon he has just discovered being the unholy offspring of lightning and death itself. There's also a tragic version of the same theme. Later in the film, when the dragon is drowning underwater and Hiccup is desperately trying to free him. This should be enough to give you a sense of what I'm going to be explaining, but there are more versions of this theme I'll show you later on, including when it is moved to another meter to signify joy and relief of Hiccup's father realizing his son is alive. In these examples, the theme here has been transferred to fit onto other scales and harmonies, but there's a lot more going on. The focus of this video will be on details of mapping a melody from one scale to another scale so that you can make a theme fit any harmonic context you want it to. I'll explain fundamental methods including cases where the original scale and the target scale don't have the same number of notes per octave. And I'll go beyond just applying a mathematical operation to a series of notes. I want to cover some psychological factors as well about which notes are more important and why, how mapping can work together with ornamentation, and when you might want to think about a melody not just as a set of scale degrees and intervals. Mapping is an operation you apply to the elements of a set, and in scalar mapping, the elements are going to be pitches. The operation involves measuring pitches in terms of a scale, and then taking those measurements and transferring them onto another scale or location in a scale. I'll start with two methods for doing this, the scale degree method and the interval method. I want mapping to apply to musical themes, but that will complicate things more than I'd like to start out with. That's because a theme is more than a series of pitches. It has rhythm, meter, harmony, and importantly, what constitutes the musical theme is not objective. Themes are subjective psychological units. Some notes will feel more important than others in defining what you're hearing. For now, let's focus on melodies only as a series of pitches, and then I'll gradually bring in complicating factors as we move through the material. That's why before discussing John Powell's themes, I want to first analyze a few melodies from Debussy. This is the opening to Fet. The underlying scale I'll use to measure this is a diatonic scale with three flats. I want some orientation for the scale so that I can assign numbers for each of its pitches, which I'll call scale degrees. And whenever I refer to scale degrees, you'll see this little caret symbol above the number. I want scale degree one to be musically significant as a reference point. So I'm going to set scale degree one either as the tonic of the overall key or as the root of the harmony at that particular moment. This melody is oriented around F, and in the piece there are strings repeating the notes F and C. So I'll make the pitch F scale degree 1, then G will be scale degree 2, etc. And this particular scale is a mode called F Dorian. It is a seven note scale because there are seven notes per octave. The box I've put around the scale just indicates what I'm thinking of as the primary octave for whatever scale I'm dealing with. Because I'm treating octaves as distinct, I'm in a linear pitch space, but if you thought of octaves as equivalent, you'd be conceptualizing a circular pitch space. We can now define Debussy's pitch series as a set of scale degrees. I'll show you later why I generally prefer thinking in intervals, but scale degrees are an easier approach to explain first. Transposition is one of the most straightforward types of mapping. To do a transposition, you move a melody from one scale to another scale of the same type and preserve all the scale degrees. If our target scale is another Dorian one, 
but now with a flat as scale degree 1, then we can take the same series of scale degrees and apply them to the new scale. The new melody will sound pretty much the same, but it isn't exactly the same. It will be in a different register than before. Moving instruments or voices into a different range is a great reason for transposing music. Things will be a little more interesting if we map the melody onto a different type of scale, though. If I want to go to an A mixolydian scale, then the melody has a slightly adjusted flavor to it, because the size of intervals measured in semitones will be different. You might not hear much difference, though, and that's part of the point, because there's a new context, but it should still sound like the same theme. Debussy doesn't go through the entire thing this way, probably for more variety, and because the meter has changed. Notice that Debussy creates variety with an adjustment to the end of the phrase, as well as rhythmic and harmonic textures that accompany this theme. So keep in mind that mapping is only one tool to create variety, and you can combine it with others. In the examples so far, the scale degrees were preserved, but we can also move an idea to a different location in the scale by adding or subtracting the same number to all the scale degrees. Let's try mapping the original melody onto this scale, which is a mode of melodic minor called the acoustic scale. I'll preserve all scale degrees first and end up with this. If I add four to all scale degrees, then it starts on A flat, like this. I like the scale degree method at certain times, but in my experience, it's a bit cumbersome to improvise with. I think it's more intuitive and streamlined if you focus mostly on intervals between notes instead. When defining a melody intervallically, I don't want to use the terms second, third, fourth, and fifth, because that might get confusing when I start to use scales that aren't seven notes per octave. Instead, I'll define intervals as a number of scale steps, and plus will mean the interval is going up, minus will mean it's going down. Here's the mapping onto the D-flat acoustic scale from before, starting on the pitch A-flat. But now I'll show you how I'm preserving intervals measured as scale steps. This is decent, but it's too tedious to go one note at a time through an entire series like this, and it also doesn't feel like a very human way to process intervals. We have a lot of notes here, but we can practice what psychologists call chunking to make it more manageable. I will streamline this by finding notes in metrically important spots, finding patterns that repeat, and then thinking about intervals between those chunks. In the case of this melody, I'd notice that the first half has a lot of upward motion by step through the scale. In other words, it has a repetition of the interval plus one a bunch of times. The second half repeats three note shapes, starting from a different scale degree each time, and each one of these units is like a mapping embedded within the melody, such that there's a unit of minus one plus one, which occurs again down two steps, and then down two steps. There's an important practical takeaway from the idea of chunking notes according to strong beats, and that is that making changes to the notes on weak beats usually has less effect if the large-scale intervallic relationships between strong beats can be preserved. We already saw how Debussy mapped this melody to an A mixolydian scale and created some variety at the ending. When that idea repeats again, it does so with a higher high point, but since that occurs on a weak beat, it is still clearly the same idea from before. Let's practice mapping intervals with the idea of chunking, but I have in mind a pretty cool added possibility. We can change the underlying scale partway through. To understand how this works, I'm going to sketch mappings on two different scales first. In both of these cases, I want D to be my point of reference, my scale degree of one. I'll do one mapping onto a D acoustic scale, and then another mapping on D melodic minor. Here's rehearsal mark 14 from Debussy. He has the theme start with the first mapping on its way up, but when it descends, it goes through the other scale. Actually, Debussy does this technique twice in a row. First he does it with D flat as the root, then with D natural as the root, so there's another layer added of repetition and variety. <laughs> 
so far we've thought about melodies as scale degrees and as intervals or chunks of intervals, but harmonic context can sometimes trump intervallic consistency of a melody. Inspecting the melody here, you might notice that the pattern in the second half also descends through the chord tones of F minor, which are F, A flat, and C. Watch what happens if I want to start this melody on G instead of F and preserve all the intervals. Now the second half doesn't have any chord tones of an F minor triad on the strong beats. So to make this sound more like the original, we might want to lean into the harmonic context over pristine intervallic preservation. Debussy makes a subtle change to one of those little three note units so that it only goes down a step. And now the line can hit the chord tones. Let's have a listen. And even though an interval was changed, you might not notice anything is different because of the harmonic context. And that's kind of the point. You'll also be looking at a transposition here so that I spared you having to deal with the six flats of A-flat Toria. We'll encounter something similar in John Powell's score to How to Train Your Dragon. But a good takeaway for now is that you don't have to preserve every interval, especially if a mapping targets a chord tone. And that feature of being a chord tone might actually supersede the specifics of an interval's size. Now let's see what happens if we map between two scales that have a different number of notes per octave. I want to take my melody from Debussy and map it onto a whole tone scale. But since this scale only has six notes per octave, there's no scale degree seven. And that's why when scales have different numbers of notes per octave or different cardinalities, I recommend using the interval method. Scales can also have more than seven notes per octave. And to dig into that possibility, let's start with the theme that opens Bartok's Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celesta. For this melody, the underlying scale is now a chromatic scale, which has all 12 notes per octave. So now every scale step is also a semitone. If our new scale is the octatonic scale, which is an eight note scale alternating whole and half steps, we would map it as follows. Now let's see what happens if we want to map it to a seven note scale, like the C acoustic scale, using the scale degree method. We encounter a wrinkle because there's no scale degree eight, so we need to try out the interval method at that point. In order to have the mapped melody sound related to the original, it is important to preserve the rhythmic and metric character overall. There can be some small adjustments, but try to preserve the notes that are on strong beats of the meter. Bartok does make a few rhythmic adjustments, but they're barely noticeable. Now we can go back to John Powell's theme from How to Train Your Dragon that I played at the beginning. For simplicity, let's just assume that this is the prime form of the flying theme I'm going to discuss. I think it also has specific connection with the Night Fury dragon named Toothless, who Hiccup becomes friends with. For us to harness this theme with freedom and nuance, we need to figure out what its most important intervallic characteristics are by chunking patterns that repeat and noticing 
essential motion between strong metric locations. Once we have a sense of the essential motion, it'll be easier to add or take away notes when we want to. Looking at the strong beats, you'll notice that the theme descends by step through an entire D major scale, but the rate of descent accelerates as the theme goes on. Now I want to interpret some structural components or chunks, which I'll call the body and the tail for this theme. The body has two halves, which each involve a leap down, a leap up, and then a step up. The tail is a stepwise descent that begins with some repeated notes, and then the rate of motion through the scale accelerates. If you think intervallically, we can use mapping as a way of developing a theme by continuing a pattern. This is a way to add material to a theme. If I want more body, I could map the opening intervals onto the next measure to create some continuation there. Similarly, I could also extend the tail like this. If you think those four note units at the beginning sound equivalent, then implicitly the size of the leap down doesn't matter much because it isn't actually the same each time it happens. The first one is minus three scale steps, but the second one is only minus two. This could support what I've mentioned previously, that weak beats aren't as important in defining the shape of a theme. We could, for example, take away melodic motion from those weak beats, and it should still sound like the theme. That simplified the melody, but we can also ornament the melody by adding extra notes in between. But again, since all of these changes happen on relatively weak parts of the meter, it doesn't sound like a significant change to the theme's identity. This is a principle you can keep in mind if you want to adapt a melody to another meter. You should maintain the essential profile of the notes falling on strong beats. Here's a joyful version to fit into 3-4 when Hiccup's father realizes his son is alive. The woodwinds and strings maintain the essential motion stretched to preserve which notes fall on strong beats. The glockenspiel also adds in some extra material that fills in the gaps of the longer notes. Keeping in mind the important notes and the overall structure, we can start mapping the theme to other scales without rigidly copying every note. The track Forbidden Friendship has some great examples of this. Just as the friendship between the characters Hiccup and Toothless gradually develops, John Powell's theme emerges in fragments and simplified versions before it eventually comes together into its complete form. If I map the theme to B major and omit the leap downward and downward run, we end up with this fragment. And staying in B major, we could also map it to start on scale degree five, but instead of omitting the leap down, we can jettison the step up at the end of each unit. I'm choosing to still think about the note B as scale degree one, but since F sharp is the root of the harmony here, you could also reorient yourself to make F sharp scale degree one. It's a climactic moment when we finally get the full theme in the key of D-flat. And then there's a harmony part that you can now think of like a mapping of it up a third. 
Let's explore mappings of this theme in a minor key. A mapping in G minor with scale degree 1 on the downbeat would look like this. When Hiccup's friend Astrid discovers Toothless, fright turns to mild tension, and John Powell also adds rhythmic activity by using repeated notes in between this main line. Let's listen to another possibility. If we switch to E minor, but start on scale degree 3 instead of scale degree 1. If we map the intervals mechanically, we end up with a leap down to D that doesn't quite sound right for the E minor harmony that occurs there. I've mostly been defining notes according to scale degrees and interval sizes, but not all intervals need to be defined as a certain size. Instead, the first leap down of this theme could also be defined as a leap down to a chord tone rather than a specific size. This helps understand why John Powell adjusted the opening interval to be a third when we hear the theme on harp, because it preserves the motion to a chord tone. We've tried a minor version that starts on scale degree 1 and then on scale degree 3, so naturally let's try starting on scale degree 5, which would be the last chord tone of a minor triad. Notice that for the original interval size of minus 3 scale steps, the second note would not land on a chord tone anymore. In the version that Powell writes, he does adjust the opening interval, and it's also on a weak beat, so it's barely noticeable that any change has even occurred there. There's something else happening in this desperate and tragic version of the theme. There's an extension by continuing the intervallic pattern of repeated notes in the tail section of it. Once you start thinking about that first interval as a leap to a chord tone, instead of a specific interval size, you can get away with pretty much any downward leap size at that spot. When the Night Fury is captured by Vikings, there's a devastating version of the theme with huge leaps in the body before veering into a chromatic fragment version of the tail. Notice that in this radically transformed version, it still preserves the idea of a body and a tail and having chunks that descend by step. You might notice that bigger changes occur later on in this version of the theme. There are also complications that arise when a theme perches upon a dominant harmony in a minor key. That's because it may force you to grapple with raised and lowered versions of certain scale degrees. Let's imagine I want to do a mapping in the key of G minor, but over a D major harmony. Since G is the tonic, but D is the root of the chord, I could pick either one of those as scale degree 1. Whichever one you pick, there are still going to be two versions of the notes E and F that you might want to use, and it'll come down to aesthetic choices, specifics of the melodic motion you have, and whether or not you want to allow an augmented second in your line. When Hiccup panics reading in the Dragon Book about how dangerous the Night Fury is, we hear an ornamented version that avoids augmented seconds and uses both forms of the note E. Let's continue to think of G minor as our key, D major as the harmony, and D as scale degree 1, but think about starting the theme on scale degree 5 instead of scale degree 1. Since my chord tones are D, F sharp, and A, I'll have the leaps down go to a chord tone of D instead of preserving the exact number of scale steps, as we've done previously. If I don't care about augmented seconds, the theme would end up like this. That's pretty close to a version that John Powell often uses with Vikings, but he opts for more body, 
less tail, and some ornaments that bring out the other form of F. This shape also avoids any augmented seconds. Let's go through one more final version of this theme. In this tense and desperate version, there's more lead-in material and variety, fragmentation, extension, and multiple changes of scale throughout. It begins in D Dorian starting on scale degree 1, then moves through a chromatic mediant harmony, and then begins again on A minor starting on scale degree 5. Listen for the way the leaps on weak beats can move to chord tones, and the extension of repeated note patterns occurs in the tail. That's a pretty spectacular set of transformations that the theme has now undergone. Now you have some basic tools to develop a theme and to fit it into different harmonic, metric, and emotional contexts by using scale degrees, intervals, chunking, plus some of my tips about strong beats and chord tones. If you found this valuable, check the description for information about related content as well as ways to support the channel.